again, it's Paul Feuerstein. And what a pleasure I have today to speak to a dear friend, colleague, Leslie Canham. Leslie, how are you? The understated. I'm, I'm doing very well today. Thank you very much. So I'd like to just introduce you, people to you a little bit, and then I'll let you fill in the blanks. First of all, I don't want to uh, get in trouble with your husband, Mike, but Leslie is the hottest person in dentistry right now. Everybody wants to talk to Leslie. She is the ultimate expert on OSHA compliance, infection control, sterilization. She gives lectures at meetings, which don't exist right now, but she gives lectures. She's been on Zoom all over the place. I can't turn on Zoom without finding Leslie to giving a little speech someplace. Um, she does training virtually online in office. I don't know if you're doing it in office in a second, but uh, training on uh, OSHA compliance, infection control. And here we are, everybody's telling us new guidelines and everybody's telling us a different story. And that's why I'd like to speak to you because I don't know what to do. <laughs> so so get, tell us a little bit more about what you're doing and uh, then, then just kind of answer, what, where, what are we doing now? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I tell you, Paul, things have really changed. And of course, um, you know, it, that goes without saying, but I think probably the biggest thing that I want people to know is that everybody understands the word infection control today. A, a few years back, and when I first started doing this, I'm about 20 years into doing lecturing and, and whatnot on OSHA and, and infection control and regulations for dental offices. And when someone would ask me what I do, who is not in dentistry, I would tell them that I, I speak on infection control and office safety for dental professionals. And I think when they heard the word infection control, they thought, well, gee, does that mean wound management for surgeries or does that mean antibiotic prescribing? But I think everybody here understands now in the world that we are talking about uh, how to prevent the disease of infection and, and uh, what we do for the steps for preventing infection transmission. And of course, boiled down into dentistry, we, we perform the same procedures we've always performed using universal precautions. But of course, today, we have a new kid on the block and with COVID-19, we have a virus that uh, can be potentially aerosolized and can live on surfaces for long periods of time and, and can be uh, infectious even with somebody not having any symptoms. They come into our practice and, and they seem to be fine, but they can be shedding the virus. And I, think so, that's the biggest, I think that's the biggest nightmare is that uh, I know officers are doing things that will take the temperature of people before they come in, they're polling them, they're asking them questions, people are perfectly fine, but they're not. That, you know, and I think, yeah. I think that, that all of those steps are going to be incorporated. We'll have probably new guidelines and recommendations from CDC. We currently have them. And it's been changing rapidly as, as new information and new science comes out about this virus. We've had changes that are interim guidance for dental settings and, and give us the steps for uh, preparing our practice to receive a patient right now for emergency case patient care. So screening patients will definitely be part of our new normal for uh, providing care for dental patients. And, and I'm also getting recommendations about waiting rooms that could, will not exist anymore, basically. Get your magazines, throw them all out, things like that. Uh, it, it's going to be a completely different way to practice, one person at a time in the office, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, right, we don't want to have people that uh, that may be shedding the virus in our reception area, touching things that are difficult to clean and disinfect. So for the time being, it's going to be like one person at a time coming in. If you have emergencies, multiple emergency, and really the, the definition of emergent care really is, I mean, it starts with you know, blocking airway, threatening to life, you know, severe bleeding and swelling. And then there's other dental emergencies, but we can look more toward the painful hurting uh, emergencies that would that would harm life at this moment in time. And as we get further yeah, along, we'll start to get back to the normal business of care for patients, but our new normal will probably be restricting, at least to begin with, access to our office and reception room to one person at a time. So I've heard recommendations, for example, of and the pa when the patient comes in, to have them rinse with something. Everybody has a different idea of rinsing. Is that really helpful? And and what would be the ideal rinse? I guess. Well, you know that. The science and, and data reveals that there's very little effect of pre-procedural mouth rinses and it reduces it to the tune of maybe one log. But you know, we need to use all the tools in our arsenal. So if the patient's pre-procedurally mouth rinsing, if they're washing their hands, if we're wearing the proper personal protective equipment that is appropriate for the task of the procedure we're performing, if we're disinfecting our surfaces appropriately with the right products and for the right amount of time, you know, those are all the key factors that are going to help us to have a safer work environment. 
and there may be others. We, we've been uh, faced with standard precautions where we've always protected ourselves and our patients from hepatitis and HIV transmission and herpes and, and fungi and MRSA, for example. So all the things we've been doing all along are still going to be in place. But now we are possibly facing elevated airborne uh, types of, of precautions that, that set, live, give us to a new level, uh, lend itself to a new level, uh, similar to what we might face with a patient who has active infectious TB, where we can't protect ourselves with our typical surgical face mask, and we can't protect others where that person has been in the room. These, these aerosols would be coming from your hand pieces, hygienists using um, um, cavitrons, things like that? Absolutely. And you know, the science is showing us that the droplets are, uh, can go as far as uh, six feet, but we're also hearing more information from the scientists that it may be it, it going further and that aerosols uh, can remain suspended in the air. And, and in the uh, New England Journal, they had a, uh, or pardon me, the National Institute of Health uh, publication in the middle of March that aerosols can remain suspended from COVID-19 for as long as three hours in the air. So that presents a whole new set of challenges. Measles can remain suspended in the air for two hours at a time. But fortunately, we haven't had large outbreaks of measles. Last year was our biggest year, and it was just over 1,200 people, and you know maybe 600 in a big year in the last 20 years, and then handfuls of like maybe 100, 150, 175. But this virus is, is uh, presenting itself everywhere. And so I think we're looking at uh, what what things can we do? What what PPE must we wear? What engineering controls can we include, including rubber dam and including high velocity evacuator and maintaining your HPE unit so that it's uh, sucking really well. And, and that means making sure that you're maintaining it on the, uh, the motor side and the pump side. What about things like air purifiers and and what is all this stuff about negative pressure rooms and all that? I don't really understand a lot of that. Most dental offices don't have the negatively pressure treatment room. So uh, hospitals do. If you wanted to set up a clean room, you could do that, and, but you'd have to have a closed door and you'd have to have the appropriate type of air filter with exchanges outside of the room at a certain rate. And of course, still, uh, people who treat a patient uh, who would need to be treated in an airborne isolation room would still need to be protected with the uh, the personal protective equipment like the N95 respirator, face shield, and, and all the other steps that you would have in place for someone with active infectious TB. And so, so in the logistics, um, I've spoken to a couple of hygienists and they're very nervous about A, in the amount of time it's gonna take them in between patients to, to ch change over the room. It's not gonna be five minutes anymore, it looks like. So they're not gonna be seeing patient, 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 patient. They're certainly not gonna have them stacked up in the waiting room if they're running late, unfortunately. And, and then from my standpoint, and I'll have you answer all three questions, I'm in the middle of a procedure, I'm working on a patient, the hygienist says, come on, check my patient. Do I have to completely take everything apart, go down the hall, or wherever it is, change it to something else in that room, and then come back. I mean, I don't even know how this whole thing's gonna come, how, how's it gonna all work? What, what are you suggesting? Well, we, we can only speculate at this point. I don't have a crystal ball, but I'm hoping that when we get the virus under control, we can elevate our precautions to the level of recognizing that there's an airborne factor and uh, the personal protective equipment. What we have done in the past is we could wear the same PPE from person to person, except for gloves and mask, of course. But, but the clinical jacket or gown could be worn from one patient to another unless it was soiled or contaminated. And uh, except maybe in cases where a, a surgery took place. My dad's an endodontist and he, he would, for an apicoectomy, he would uh, wear the isolation gown that was sterilized. And, and he would remove it after the patient's care before he saw another patient. He would wear surgical exam gloves. So now we're looking at, uh, you know, what are we going to be facing coming forward? Are we going to have disposable head coverings and shoe coverings and disposable gowns that go all the way to the ground? And would it be appropriate to, to uh, change them in, in between a patient? So it might be a, a difference of how administrative controls, maybe how we're scheduling patients. Maybe hygiene patients would be seen at a different set schedule where the dentist could come in regularly, maybe during paperwork or charting sessions without having recently come from another patient's chair side. This is going to be a whole new world of, of just not figuring out how to practice it in general. I, I, I don't know. Uh, tell me something. Am I going to have to shave off my beard? I'm really, <laughs> what, what am I going to have to do? I know the, 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 the N95 isn't going to be a tight 
seal around here. No, neutral hair definitely impedes the seal of an N95 respirator. And so you would want to protect yourself better. I don't know, maybe you could find like, you could go with a groove. You could make a new style of, of uh, you know, <laughs> and, and I've have seen, I've seen some face. head shields that covers the face and everything. I've seen all sorts of, uh, of things like right. that. Um, right. <laughs> you know, but I, I think we have to just, and just sit back and, and, and listen to everybody. And I, 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 don't, I think, Everybody's going to have their own comfort level, certainly. But that's the thing that I'm hearing now. I'm starting to get emails from patients saying, how are you people protecting us? Right. And, and, and we have to be pretty on point to, to, to tell these patients that, don't you worry. And meanwhile, I'm worried. I'm, I'm, I'm old, way over 60 years old. And I'm, I'm scared right now. <laughs> And rightfully so, you know, healthcare providers who are over 60 and who have uh, underlying healthcare conditions or health conditions should certainly be alarmed about their own safety in, in, in treating patients. But I think your point is right on topic where how do we convince our patients that we, we have and always will protect them when it comes to infection prevention. We're paying close attention to CDC guidelines and we're watching the changes. We also protect our team following all the OSHA guidance, including whatever new respiratory protection we're going to need to have. We're paying attention to get this. This is my secret sauce. My secret sauce is OSAP, the Organization for Safety oh, yes. and Prevention. They're the one-stop shopping place for everything infection control and OSHA compliance in dentistry. And they've got some marvelous charts and checklists and will likely pave the way for us for infection control and safety, whether it's for the dental team or for the patient, along with likely, as they have in the past, giving us the right verbal skills so that our clinical team and our front office team, who might be at the first contact of the patient or screening patients uh, prior to treatment, uh, the scheduler is going to have to be saying the same things that we're saying in the clinical area. We are going to protect you in our practice. We are taking all of the recommendations and state regulations and guidance from our state dental associations, who will certainly help us in this rolling out or reopening of dental practices to know what it is that we need to do to make sure that we're taking the proper steps. And, and the other end of that is that we have to follow that. You know, there was a lot of non-believers when it came to social distancing and people thought, oh, you know, well, there's only so many cases and it's not going to happen to me. Well, you know, look where we are today with the number of cases, the number of deaths, and of course, the number of recovered people who, who had COVID-19 didn't even know they had it. Right. Well, I'm, you know, I mean, OSAP, Michelle, Michelle and, Andy, and Andy are all doing such a great job over there. And I also like to, how, how would people get in touch with you to find out uh, if they want specific training, if they want information from you? I know you have a website, which is basically your name, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> That's right. My website is, uh, is Leslie at LeslieCanham.com. So it's L-E-S-L-I-E at L-E-S-L-I-E and then C-A-N-H-A-M, like canham.com. Can that's where folks can reach me. I'm doing a lot of webinars, a lot of on-site, in training, remote training, where I would have been on-site training or speaking uh, in front of groups. I'm doing that same thing through webinars and telecommuting, just like we are right now, and uh, helping people sort of get I, how, steps in place of how to prepare their team, their practice, and, and their patients for, for the days ahead as we open up and return to our new normal. Well, you've always been a great, great friend and great resource to me on all this information here. And now you are at the top of the chain right now. So be careful what you wish for. <laughs> That's right. That control has always been important, but it's never been so top of mind as it has been for everybody as it is today. So, Leslie, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, it's beautiful that you're sitting on your outside porch in California. <laughs> I'm it's stuck in Boston. Yeah. We had snow the other day. I mean, a little, a little different out in the Boston area. But uh, enjoy the weather. Stay outside. Stay away from other people, <laughs> except for Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And uh, it, was, it was a pleasure. It was a real pleasure. And, and I'm sure we'll be talking again because I have so many more questions and people are going to be asking questions. So I think we'll be hooking up again before, uh, not before too long. Okay. I guess it goes to say I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. All righty, Paul. Thanks so much. Bye-bye, everybody.